Welcome back to the New Order, my friends. I'm your host, of course, as you probably know by now, Mr. Mocha Lover, but workers protest for tariffs. Today in Madrid, thousands of farmers have joined a protest on the street outside the Iberian Council Chambers for third night straight. The issue that joins these farmers in a protest is a recent announcement by Cadillo Franco that detailing government plans to ease in the tariffs on all economic sectors. The government states that the continued abolishment of tariffs will encourage the international market to engage with Iberia and will spur international investment in the Iberian economy over the long term. The farmers, however, remain unconvinced. Furthermore, the farmers are not alone in the protest. Many employees from the manufacturing industries have also turned out to express their displeasure with the removal of tariffs, arguing that the influx of cheaper foreign imported goods will force Iberian industries to make layoffs and might even entice local industries to immigrate. The Cadillo has put my livelihood at risk. My family has for eight generations survived off our humble farm, but now cheap imported tariff-free goods and foods will soon fill the sh store shelves. How are we to compete when I can hardly sell my produce? Questioned Reyes Gallego. He inherited his family farm just outside of Madrid two decades ago, but like many Iberian farmers in recent months, he has been struggling to make ends meet. With Iberian consumers likely to prefer the cheaper imported goods in stores, many farmers such as Mr. Gallego question how they remain afloat. The Cadillos have yet to make any comment on the protests as liberalization and measures continue to be passed. Government spokespersons have, however, stated that the Iberian administration remains enthusiastic about the economic opportunities that will be presented with increased liberalization. Cheaper goods, you say, huh? Market liberals are weakened? That sucks because it strengthens these guys, which I don't like. I think give it that. We did the best we can. Uh, right now we're doing Iberia, though, is different, which is... Um, I think I read this earlier. If you want to read this game, please go ahead. We've got some comments to go through, too. So, I'll be honest, between this episode and the last, I don't remember what I read. So, unrest, quash, and Jamaica, huh? Bring the I and I to Portugal, eh? If you want to read about this one, please go ahead. England defeats Wells, that's pretty normal. Uh, yeah, if you want to read this, please go ahead. So, with this one, we'll get some more uh, economic growth by 0.3%. Miscellaneous income will increase by 0.1%, which is very nice as well. Uh, but like I said, we do have some comments as a poverty is slowly getting better. Which is kind of reassuring. Uh, reformism is at 72 out of 100. Uh, let's see, they're generally aligned towards Franco, but on the pequeño restaurante en la concha. A crescent of sand surrounded the bright blue waters of San Sebastian, Basque Country, Playa de la Concha was packed with people far more tourists than Spaniards or Portuguese. The sounds of waves, birds were accompanied by a cacophony of French, Italian, and even German voices. But the most prominent among them were the English, whose family celebrated an escape from the banal office work and school. Geoffrey and Maureen were among them, a young couple seeking a break from the commotion. They stepped into a sleepy diner, many tables and booths, but only a few other customers. Welcome, welcome, shouted the excited owner. What can I get for you today? Geoffrey, looking around, was a bit puzzled. The air smelled of ham, bacon, coffee, and toast. Hardly what he call it lunch fare. Have you started serving lunch yet? The owner suffered a laugh. Lunch is only 12.45. What? What is it then? 1.30! Or when is it? 1.30. Jeffrey's eyes widened. Don't worry, I know you Brits like lunch early. I'm sure I can make something for you. How do you like ham and cheese sandwiches sell? I suppose that's alright, Marina opined. A couple of the booth. Gazing at the coast through the window, the ham sandwiches were alright, nothing too special, but the experience was. The throngs of people from across Europe all in one place, their bodies and energized and minds relaxed, running and swimming and fraternizing. The smell emanating from the kitchen as the staff prepared for the lunch rush. And above all else, a simple piece in the bright corner of an increasingly treacherous continent. The iron country becomes even richer. Nice. Uh, Metro. Ooh, Mr. Research says, yes, yes, absolutely. I forgot about that. Uh, but I'm not going to do any of this stuff because I don't want to hurt Franco's opinion because we need Franco as the leader. Sponsor new companies, huh? Oh. Now, proof is this man's opinion, which would be nice. The industrial capacity effects of our mir economic miracle will increase by 10%. I might have read this one earlier, but I'm going to read it again. Now that the INI has been established across all of the Iberian Union, we can begin to make the most other strength in organization. While the roots of the organization still settle in the Portugal, however, what we would be only be failing to see the initiative. As the INI organizes it itself across Portugal, We'll provide funding in the INI to the INI across Iberia to finance the creation of new companies, as well as ensuring the expansion of already existing companies, be they private or public. Through exploring the existing organizations within Iberia and using them to expand the fledging companies around the Union, we'll soon find our economy to only stabilize and improve in the coming years. Yay! Fuel tanks, yay! Helicopters, we're not going to use these, but yay! Uh, build apartment buildings. As the economy slowly improved, opportunities finally began to return to the cities, and countless Iberians were returning to their urban centers. The problem is, far too many Iberians are making a run for the cities, and the value of the housing in these regions has skyrocketed as a result to the point that few, if any, can afford to move into the cities, and many find themselves sunken into poverty as a result. To remedy the unfortunate problem, we can begin building apartment buildings around the outer rims of the city. While these apartment blocks may not be the biggest or most efficient building, they give, they'll give Iberians jobs, and they keep holding an Iberian family for Iberia. That'll be enough. A promising result. For all their past games, Frank has always been the earlier of the Cadullos. He was always present when Salazar arrived, though sitting at the board was a collaborative effort. Today it was different, though. When Salazar walked in, he found a chessboard set up and sitting next to him was Franco, waiting. You usually want to wait for me to arrive before we set up the board. Is this game? Uh, it remains to be seen. Do you believe the Germans are cutting Portugal in half? You know, they don't care, Salazar. They took it and they'll eat, cast it to the wind when it's convenient. 
What drive to keep this union going? The threat of the Germans is not as imminent as it used to be. It has been too long, and the nations have been together for so long, I would hurt the peninsula more to separate again. In his old age, Salazar made a, a, lapse, a small lapse in his judgment. Now, first time, the game has been shortened considerably. Salazar was dumbfounded. It took him another moment to realize what had just been done a few moves ago. He made no remarks and went on in his day with, with after, after the fact without a comment to Franco. Is that a start of a trend? Ooh, does he have a little bit more ability than him? Ooh, that's looking very bad, actually. Nice industrial base to incompetent industry. Ooh, that's not good. The buzz will be good, too. At least, out of the nice. Uh, we get more reason for 13. Nice. We need 25. No. There you go. Ah, federal consumption tax. Oh, no. As the American government finds itself funding more more the public and private industries, the necessity of a new source of revenue is making itself clearer and clearer with each passing day. While the investments made thus far will inevitably turn a profit down the road, the government needs funds and fast. A proposed solution is to implement a federal consumption tax, where the rates will affect uh, in each and every product on the store shelves proportionally to their necessity. Essential products such as foods, tools, and the like will be taxed the least, while luxury products will be taxed the most. As a result, the government will receive new funds, and the people will experience the least amount of financial discomfort. Ah, taxation. Oh. Someone says, uh, from one of the comments from the last episode, Why didn't you send volunteers to South Africa? I didn't feel like it. I don't think I could. Maybe I could have. But I feel like it, I guess. Uh, from outside. Also, even if we did, it wouldn't have been very much for us, but... The two men who entered the Commandant Marcos' office were not the standard AAS agents that slipped through the door, and he knew it. They carried themselves with an air that was so often mis missing from the office that Marcos had nearly forgotten how it looked to be among the real professionals, of course. Oh, look at this! Even if Marcos had been less observant, the German egos that had adorned their identification would have given it away. He raised an eyebrow as he gestured to the two seats, which they took. Marcos began politely, My friends, welcome to Iberia. My name is Marcos Arroyo. You're agents Lerva and Tiger, yes? The two agents nodded, their eyes tracing the room, floating across the bookshelves filled with files and the cluttered desks. Once again, I offer my deepest thanks to your government for sending such experienced aids. May we see one of your files? After action reports, of course, surveillance, and like. One of the two chimed in. Marcos wasn't sure which tiger and which one was Lova, but he handed some of uh, the folders over to the men. They opened them up, chattered among themselves. Marcos strained to hear, but soon realized that they weren't speaking Spanish, and after a few minutes, they set the files back down. Now, Commandant Marcos, you, what you and your AAS have here is a uh, start. There's certainly room for improvement, and we'll help you get there now. Shall we begin? Of course. Now this, if we wait 13 days, we can get, oh, maybe more than 13 days. You know what? We're not going to have that political power, probably. Uh, go into that anyway. Screw it. Ties of change. General waves like the Calcella Valle Beach. Low tide revealing all the manner of the fjords and debris to once obscured by the war. Or water, I mean. What better place to relax on a hot summer afternoon? Isabel, uh, Telinda, and Regina certainly thought so. Alas, so, so busy this time of year ever since they built the hotel. Um, vacations from Madrid and other inland cities. For her and tourists, and oh, oh, so many. Whores, Isabel chuckled. They all look like whores. The American women are like the most hideous. Tiny beginnings clung to their groins and chests like the chewing gum to school desks. At least the Brazilians usually had the decency to cover their torsos, yet only the Iberians and Italians seem to have the dignity to cover their thighs anymore. Dear Linda's eyes widened. Oh my goodness. Look, is that? No way. Eugenia? As a blood of left hand over her mouth, her expression a uh, mix of disgust and amusement. You see an American girl dressed like that was one thing, but a local? A classmate, no less? That wasn't something you saw every day. What a slut. Regina gasped, look, Maria and Natalia too, and Mafalda? What on earth what is happening here? Have they all lost their minds and they have no manners? Or in the slightest bit of shame? Oh, though, come to think of it, this bathing suit does get rather warm sometimes. 17, huh? Bruh. Hey, oopsie. You know what? Because of that mistake, I'm going to have to reload this in. That's okay. That's okay, I'll redo it just a little bit. Uh, federal consumption tax followed up with, ooh, national expansion. Oh, this political power, I don't like that. More tax and more, which is nice. A revival is a SEMPA. And the ages passed, the state organization of SEMPA, the Servicio Nacional de Productos Agrarios, has managed the production and distribution of agrarian products as well as derivatives. With this grand responsibility, SEMPA has also regulated the price of these products so this organization has fallen from grace since Iberian Union began trading with other nations once again. It's made it harder and harder for SEMPA to manage the prices of these products and price of production return to obeying natural demand. The question is then how do we tackle the question of SEMPA? One potential solution would be to totally reorganize SEMPA and to shed the notion of total control over the Iberian market of Iberia. The Iberian Union is changing. It's high time that SEMPA change with it. While I provide the organization with new funds, its directive will change from an organization set to monitor and regulate the markets to an organization set to represent the interests of the Iberian government in the realm of Iberian matters. Someone else asks, as a comment, another Viaca playthrough going for the democratic sometime? Maybe eventually. Someone says, Mocha liking funny Russian men? Couldn't be. Anyone else, of course. So it says, it would be cool to see GUI with an Iberian infrastructure and dam plan, as a Gibraltar dam got deleted, of course. 
So, and, and someone else says, you need to keep the terrorist support at minimum. And instead of saving resources, because if the support is high, they'll get resources faster. And, then, and you're increasing both their activity and supplies. Green over red. Well, they might be the lesser partner in our union. The Portugal's not been spared from the scourge of terrorism. The communist FSLP has relentlessly terrorized their Western brothers, killing hundreds in their bloody quest for revolution. Now that the hills and shores of the fair Portugal peaceful at first, or last so finally, after being driven from the urban hideouts, the FSLP fled into the countryside, taking up refuge in the wild places of the land they sought to liberate. The Portuguese branch of the AAS, however, had just studied all their moves and learned their devious tricks. Come the final slow, there was nothing the Greats could do to escape justice. At long last, the green and red of the Portuguese flag can fly happily alongside of the Iberia. No longer do patriots working on the West need to fear about being targeted as class traders and collaborators. With this blow, Portugal is the last free from fear and class conflict. A victory not just for Portugal, but for the entire Union as a whole. And we're still only stable. God dang it, come on. Um, new agricultural methods. It's an unfortunate fact of laughing at beer that the overwhelming majority of farmers operate with ancient uh, equipment and hardly modern techniques. The reason for this is quite simple. The farmers are incapable of purchasing these new technologies for lack of funds. As a result, our agricultural output is far cry from what it could be. Our solution to those glaring issues is rather simple. We'll put vast amounts of these new technologies and equipment and sell them to the poorest farmers. By allowing the best aspects of governmental participation to strengthen the people, I beer will become the gold standard for capable government practices. A modest tax hike. What do you mean I have to pay 6.5 pesetas for this loaf of bread? It clearly signs as 6 pesetas. Guillermo has not paid enough for this. I'm sorry, ma'am. The new sales tax just took effect this morning. A new tax and you couldn't fix your prices before then? The line of customers now stretching nearly to the bakery's front door. Guillermo could pro practically tell, feel his managers watching it grow. Well, everything fixed soon, Guillermo replied. The woman stood silently. No, ah, no, I, I still need you to pay for that. For 6 pesetas? The manager himself placed, at, was, placed himself at the register. No, that bread cost 6.5 pesetas. We've kept the price as low as possible. If you're not going to pay, I'm going to ask you to leave my store. Grumbling under her breath, the woman slammed some quans on the table and obscored, absconded with her bread before Guillermo even had counted them. At least she had paid full price in the end. Next one was an older man with a, a selection of marzipan of chocolates. Just imagine if she knew how high the tax on this was, he joked. Pray she chooses another store next time. Well, we'll see. Having that much political power is nice. I should have waited to do this one, but whatever. Um, but, hey, at the same time, all we have left is the ETA. Keep them nice and low. Nice and low. Promote consumption. At present, consumption within Iberia has greatly sunk him, which has meant fewer goods are in circulation and the production has not had, had much to put in an effort to keep up with the demand. While thrifty population is hardly a hardy one, we must bring the minds of the people up to speed with the needs of the economic growth. Through an advertising campaign dedicated to the notion of a happy family, as well as a compulsory sales season surrounding Christmas, consumption will greatly increase. While this will also increase economic growth and prosperity for industries across the board, it will also pad the walls of the Iberian government by taking advantage of the federal sales tax. It'd be kind of nice, you know, we lose a little bit of, uh, basically 100 political power in the end, which sucks, but whatever. Um, oh, look, look at those guys. Do we do anything about the French Civil War? Because they're literally right next to us. Before we let it go on, so, French Civil War. Salve, civilian dictatorship. Salon, fascists. Uh, revolutionaries, civil guillot. French state, Sidus. And Destin. Liberals. And there's a funny guy. Look at this guy. Shadow economy. And the spare guy. Siemens Welt, huh? Pretty cool. And then we'll read a national expansion. Probably. As we get to September. But happy September, everybody. <sighs> our debt's worse than our GDP, god dang it. <sighs> Sucks, I know. Should ever I be able to become a legitimate regional power? A considerable. Industry is going to be an inherent necessity. Unfortunately, this is something which I bear find myself considerably lacking. Any other nation might call it quits at that and declare the economy dedicated to another resource, perhaps a better adapt to the natural resources. I bear does not bend that need to the nature. From this point onwards, Iberian government will fund a variety of large scale projects, industrial projects, and will not stop until Iberia can count itself as an industrial power. Do at least. Oh! Oh! Cost five. We need four more. Oh, we're so close. We are so close. It's not funny. No one more terrorists. Ukrainian National Republic. Huh? Kubyayevich. Kubyay. Kubyayev. Kubyayevich. Look at this happy, happy, handsome guy. Reichsnell for Strecken Program. Economy. It has no effects, so I don't want to do that. Prospect new mines. The lands of Iberia have been proven rich in resources, enough to fuel economy over the past centuries and no modern day. Now we have to live on for centuries more, we must look into greater resources for the economy. Well, while in the past, coal and steel have been the fuel of the fires of industrialization, today the foundations of the future are built around the new fuel, uranium. 
between the two farms a few hours we must find it first time. Through opening up a variety of investigations across the Union, we may find that soon the Iberian Union is to sit upon a treasure trove of resources. All we can do is look. Through opening up a proper perspective, we're liable to dig up fuel for new industrialization programs. Hopefully the Union may be, will live to make good use of them. A farm grow in Madrid. Today was the first day that Concepcion had gone to visit Madrid. His streets were busy, bustling with activity, and the apartments surrounding her were large enough to comfortably eat her house her entire village. Barely uh, 80 kilometers from home, and yet she felt as though she was in a foreign country. Ahead of her was a monument in all but name, a colossus of steel and glass, taller than any oak tree, and so long she could not tell where it ended. And above its entrance, spotted in the gold bright letters, Galerias Presadios. <laughs> Concepcion felt smaller than she ever had before walking to the store, seeing dozens of people carrying twice as many bags, mothers with all their children, teenage girls with their friends, and well-dressed men, all walking around amidst hundreds of tables and rackets carrying all manner of clothing and fabrics. At the end of the store were an assortment of large appliances, dishwashers, toilets, ovens, and the distance to our right was a whole section of a makeup and jewelry. And as of that was not enough, an escalator led to another floor just as enormous and with just a varied selection. A friend described Galerias as a walking in catalog, but it was so much more French clothes and Italian decorations, Malayan spices, and Indian fruit, South African gemstones, and American appliances, everything which she had ever imagined owning could be found here. And just a single building in Madrid, and she could even afford most of it. An Iberian series? Wins the reaction. Mox in Iberia was rather a new council, but one which the general pops had taken with open arms, the country is to state. The Iberian council initially extended it only as the legislative body to break up deadlocks between Franklin and Salazar with a bit of reward for the people as a treat, and could quickly become the main voice of the average man in the government, and over the last few years it has become apparent that they have had quite a few complaints. However, something different has happened recently. Numerous scandals have broken out of nowhere, and splashed across the headlines of every newspaper in the country, and the names of the prominent reformist politicians are the subjects of these PR disasters, liberal influence, which has been gaining among the people for years, has come to a halt, total halt, even receiving some places in favor of more conservative groups. It seems that the impenetrable popularity of the reformists have finally been pierced, and now we can watch it with satisfaction as they deflate like a balloon. As cathartic as they may be, however, the question of where these sudden leaks are coming from intrudes on our enjoyment of the moment. Such a break of scandals points to foreign interference in the Council of some form, although who could be doing it is a total mystery, probably Burgundy or Germany. The AAS has begun an investigation, certainly not to be told to rush the case, or rush cases like these need substantial proof. That our position will be helped with every new scandal that pours in the papers is merely coincidental. What a break. Boom, we did it. What? Did you not what? Ah. The Basques as a whole are hardly hardy and stubborn people. For those to them who have dedicated their lives to rebellion, and this is doubly true. The ETA have been far and away the most effective terrorist group active in our beer, killing hundreds of bombs and armed attacks over the course of the campaign. However, we're gonna rest easy as the AAS has finally secured the last of the mountain bases in Basque Country. Months have passed since we began to push back the ETA in earnest. The Marshal uh, capabilities almost matched those of AAS, and it was only with military assistance that the terrorists were defeated in open battle. But for all the ferocity, they lacked the manpower and popular organic support to withstand relentless assaults. Their victory is cause for celebration, there are many questions that remain unanswered, primarily the question of their material support. The ETA never enjoyed widespread, among, widespread support among the population of their homeland, and the amount of hardware at their disposal is suspiciously high for a terrorist organization. For now, though, perhaps we should try to be content to sit on our laurels and enjoy peace in the Basque Country. Hope we've seen the last of them. Beautiful. So, now what? So, all four have been disbanded. We get like something at the end saying, hey, good job. Uh, so, Mucho took over in Manchuria, huh? That's not good. 5%? What if we did this? 5.5%? Let's go radical. We'll do that for a while. Third effects? Well, we'll see. National expansion. Expand heavy industry. One of the greatest resources within Iberia has always been iron deposits. Even today, iron has been a massive contributor to the Iberian war machine and international market, of course. We can also mill and cast as useful material and countless products which can be sold abroad. While even now we greatly benefit from the recent resource, we can always improve our margins and further exploit these profits. Well, there's a considerable amount of blast furnaces and other metallurgy across the Union, we'll all build several new establishments to further exploit this natural resource, as well as provide the Union with a stronger revenue stream. All it takes us to make to make the most of these resources is some legal work and or legwork, and we'll find ourselves rich in iron beyond our wildest dreams. 67. Rain himself? No? Okay. Way too ahead of time. Oh well. There you go. Helis. I'm not going to use probably at all. National infrastructure plan. We'll give it a month for this much money. This growth is better, but debt just keeps going higher and higher. 
Temp tax cut might work. Maybe. We're spending so much on the civilian sector, though. Yeah, attempt tax cut would not do very much, honestly. It's just all the spending. Get one more month. If it goes over six billion, we'll cut it down to half. Nah, I didn't go over six. You know, we can do it again. Inflation went down. Growth went up. We'll keep it where it's at for now. National infrastructure plan. The Bayern Union is considerably well connected in terms of transportation, at least considering the fact that the Union is an odd fusion of two nations fused together through a little beyond circumstances and determination. In fact, the infrastructure is above average, rivaled only by Germany's Autobahn. Even so, we find ourselves capable of further uniting the nation. Not only will a closely connected nation increase the community cost for products, but also labor, laboring to improve upon the infrastructure will also open up countless jobs to Iberians to increasing unemployment. The National Infrastructure Plan will do much more than build new train stations, airports, and airports, and roads. It'll also bring the Iberian Union closer together in far more ways than one. An evening in Madrid. Maria Francisca de Almeida played with her doll in the mud. Marquita Perez has been her favorite ever since it was given to her last Christmas. Marquita was digging a hole looking for buried treasure, but a large cloud loomed overhead. Slowly before the sun in the sky turned dark, and the slow trickle of rain began to fill Marquita's hole with water. Disappointed, but not overly upset. Um, Francisco went back inside. Her mother, Ga Maria Gabriela Pacheco, was exasperated to see her daughter's homemade dress completely soiled. Francisco's mother pulled off her dress and canned her buttocks. Gabriela now had to worry about a crying child and adjust to hand, wa hand wash in addition to all of her other responsibilities. Her husband Carlos returned from work reeking of the sardines he had canned. As the family tried to rest that night, a crack of thunder started startled young Luis awake. He was wailing, waking his mother. Gabriela sat up to cradle the infant, and that's where she felt it. Water, warm, moving water, at least an inch, maybe more. She laid Luis down in her bed as she rushed to turn on the light and jolted her husband awake. Carlos, Carlos, wake up! Well, darn it! Her husband, groggy and confused, struggled to regain his bearings. The house was flooded. Food, food debris floated through the kitchen and seeped into the pantry. The bathroom door creaked as light, slight shifts in the water poured it about. Pulled it about. The power went out. Gabriel could not see anything. Carlos, grab the kids. We need to get out of this. What are, what are you? What are you going? Doing, Dad? What are we going? Shouted a confused, terrified Francisco. As they evacuated, and touched rain left all four soaked, and both children crying as the parents tried to walk up a muddy road to reach higher grounds. She heard a cracking sound. A large crash of tearing wood and crushed furniture marked the collapse of her household. Life will never be the same. Breaking news from Lisbon. Cabrillo Salazar, wake up! There's been a massive flood in Lisbon. Thousands of homes were destroyed, and emergency workers have already been found... Uh, or de a dead bo dozen bodies. Electricity is out across the whole district, Cadillo. Franco's on his way and should be here any minute. Neil Cadillo's happy to have his meeting so early as her assistants rushed to grab them coffee. Antonio, this may be the worst union that has this may be the worst the union has seen since Barcelona. Barcelona may have been worse, but Terrace committed the act. Her troops have avenged the victims of the attack, but you cannot fight back against a storm uh, uh, to avenge the victims of a flood. You cannot liberate a city from nature. Ah, but you can liberate people from the suffering. We can organize emergency grain and medical shipments, send personnel from each of the other cities, and evacuate the injured. I appreciate the sentiment, but we don't even know how many injured there are, or ship the roads are in. Sending a bunch of drain trucks could do just the roads and block medical evacuation to supply unwanted grain, for all we know. A government from Lisbon for decades. I know the Portuguese National Guard can handle the situation for now. We need information before undertaking any kind of drastic response. Respond immediately. Gather information first. We'll respond immediately first. People really freaking love Franco. Wow. If that's the case... I don't mind doing a few more reforms then, because we did get it lowered a little bit, and we, we can also go ahead and re increase it then. Um, church. Leans towards us, we'll use that one. Capitalist? Oh, I'm not doing that one. Natives? The greatest story never told, if you want to do that, please go ahead. The volunteers. As Lisbon struggled to regain his footing in the days after the flood, the old ways of living uh, already seemed like a distant memory. The windows of uh, the market where Gabriela. Maria Gabriela Pacheco once shop were not broken, not by water, but by blunt force. The food was gone, seized by hordes of thieves and desperately hungry. Twice a day, disheveled strangers offered the family bread rolls at offensively high prices. But even if some men broke into markets to steal food and sell at a high, far higher price to the desperately hungry, others worked to distribute the food for free. Dozens of university students had quickly organized an effort to bake and distribute bread across the city, offering grain to several people, mostly women, who offered to produce some bread themselves. Young adults, teenagers, even some children as young as 12 were tasked with these volunteers with distributing bread. A clothing store. Uh, offer much of its inventory to those lacking clothes so they may be better protected from the elements. And many men, whether out on a sense of duty or simply boredom, began to pull rubble from the streets, tossing it into empty alleys or ruined buildings to allow vehicles into the city. Some vehicles were from the government, but at least as many were individuals bringing their own supplies from cities not hit by the flooding. These volunteer efforts are clearly positive in the signal. Signal the, the resilience of the people of Lisbon. The Cadillas began to deliberate on whether these efforts should be further encouraged by the Iberian state. Send in the army organized relief efforts? Sure, why not? Screw it. We have we have no money. I wish you could pop this up higher. 
camp's grounds. The National Guardsman Rui Furtado arrived at the evacuee campsite, hastily building the dates after the flood on the Lurie campus of the Higher Technical Institute. Sure. Um, for the second time in many days. Yesterday, he had carried a few done tons of food and medical supplies. Now, with the hunger situation mitigated, he carried fabrics as well. Thousands still lived in outdoor camps, unpleasant even on a good day, with a little protection from rain and even less from an cold weather. But now, Rui helped evacuees place tarps on the bottoms of their tents so they would not just sleep on the bare grounds, towels, uh, so they could dry off and blankets so they could sleep more comfortably. A four-seat vehicle parked outside the campsite. Rui watched a man step outside, perhaps 50 years old, begin running towards the evacuees. Luisa, are you here? The crowd emerged from women and her daughter, clearly relieved to see the man. Papa! Louisa. She had embraced the man. It's like many others, Louisa had been left homeless by the flood, but now her father had come to bring his daughter to deliver their child at home in Coimbra. With the roads mostly cleared, many others left at homeless or stranded by the flood could depart from Lisbon. While those that remained could enjoy greater rations and more comfortable living conditions. Without the continued support, we would be, they would be much worse off. Me with a big fish. Interest rates would decrease. Yes! Well, within the Iberian Union's economic battlegrounds, there are always the select few than the countless private and state corporations, which are known to be the fat cats of the markets. Our own Abs, Flex, Siemens, and Gallenbergs. Many would allow these individuals within the Union as too powerful for their own good, even if they are massive contributors to the economy. Still, though, the Iberian Union is well mended by the state necessity. A mended state by necessity. Likewise, we need to reel in those fat cats who help to collaborate for a greater future. Now, the Iberian Union is going to not only survive, but thrive. We must take the necessary measures to align the big fish of these industries to ensure economic growth. It's my regret that they do not have their heads on that pikes outside the French border. So long as they continue to bear whims, we'll stay, it'll stay that way for ages to come. Ah, oh, Cantar de Gallo. Francisco, this is a disaster for us. I mean, citizens across the union are blaming us for the lack of preparedness. I mean, families are still struggling to find food and shelter. If we're going to recover from this, we need to place restrictions on the news coverage. Uh, we'll do that just a little bit. Need it, yes. No, I don't think so. The people are going to find out. They'll be angry at us either way. And if word gets out that we're downplaying the severity of the situation, we could lose the trust of God knows how many people. We can have propagandists running around Portugal while we are in the process of sorting this out. All we'll do is this is to interfere with our recovery effort. We need the Ministry of Information to prevent this from spreading further. Franco pondered on this for a moment. As many independent journalists as possible to showcase all the good work we do. Some sort of censorship is reasonable, but we can't go too far. Well, you know, it could be better than I do. Very radically open, but everything here. Once we had 125%, I'm going to cut it back down, but there has been homeless since crisis. It's been two weeks since the flood waters washed over Lisbon. The men's outdoor camps, the evacuee camps have finally been emptied. And as winter dawns over Liberia, thousands of homeless people can now be assured, assured they will not freeze to death. However, the shelters are no substitute for real housing. The food is bad, the bedding is stiff and uncomfortable. And there's virtually no privacy. Theft is common, and worst of all, multiple incidents of rape and child molestation have been reported. I'll take time for the city to rebuild, and unfortunately, these shelters are the only place many of the Lisbonans are able to live. The emergency fund used to construct the shelters will run out in a few days. Extending funding will be quite costly. Alternatively, we can hand the task of administering the shelters over to the city officials, freeing funds for use on other important projects. Local government must contribute. We're not doing enough. Construction should be subsidized. A federal economy! While many would laugh at the notion of a Iberian Union becoming an economic powerhouse not just a few months ago, it seems that this has just been managed. Through the sheer tenacity of ambition of the Iberian government, we've successfully reversed the economic downturn of the years past and have even considerably federalized the economy. The past years of humiliation and degradation have been buried. The future now lies open with unlimited potential in store. With our economy firmly dealt with, we can now look onward not only towards recovering from the past, but building off of it. Today's a proud day for Iberia. May it last forever. Growth is not as much as I'd hoped it would be. I can guess, I can just leave the Navy, but steam is for Lisbon. Living conditions continue to recover in, in Lisbon, though the homeless rate remains higher than before, of course. Oh, wow, 67 is not very good. Most of the people displaced by the storm live with their relatives in other cities. It's shanty towns just outside the city are in tenements within. Most buildings have either been repaired or demolished, and the scars of the destruction are fading quickly. While the housing situation improves rapidly, the recovery of employment has stagnated. Businesses suffer severely with many factories and stores alike being badly damaged or destroyed entirely. Government officials have been ineffective at preventing and at times have been even complicit in uh, predatory lending that has forced business owners to choose between losing their business or having their business weighed down by interest for years to come, lacking any source of income. Thousands of those bones now rely almost exclusively on government support to thrive and survive. Few doubt that Lisbon's economy will eventually recover, but even fewer deny that the current situation remains poor. Freer's advisor suggested launching a stimulus program in order to accelerate Lisbon's recovery. However, such a program could be significantly more costly than any of our previous relief, relief efforts. Support temporary jobs to construction. Uh, or construct debt levies and diversion channels and provide low-interest loans to businesses affected by the floods. It's only money, right? We're only 110%. That's all it is, you know. As long as interest rates decrease, inflation, not so much, but interest rates, it's still 4%, which is, you know, not great, but eh, that's not bad. It could be, could be worse. We could be France. Oh, Joseph Dunnan. You sound familiar, my friend.
Military police. Atlas and Company. There were eight men in the pine shop suits that entered an inconspicuous meeting hall in Madrid. As they slowly walked in, a young bureaucrat from the Ministry of Economic Affairs made a mental note of their faces and associated corporations. Jose Manuel de Melon uh, of the Compañía Unión Fabril. A true conglomerate, and the Portuguese answer to the Zagbatsus. Antonio Champalama, one of the richest men in Iberia. His fortune derived from the clever investments and a near monopoly on the cement industry. A medical amorim, amorim, heard of the namesake like, oh, Corticiera Amorin. Uh, a leading quark conglomerate, Alexander Soros dos Santos, CEO of the retail company Her Geronimo Martins, Jose Servant, president of the National, Com uh, National Institute of Industry, Leopoldo Calvelo Sotelo, the head of the Renfa Operadora, their national rail conglomerate with a man with political ambitions, Antonio Barrero de Remo, the leader of the Telefonica, the National Telecommunic Telecommunications Company, finally leading the pack, Jose Maria Lu Ruiz, Mateos, leader of the Romasa, a hoarding company that makes up nearly 2% of the entire Iberian economy. Either group of intelligent entrepreneurs or heartless robber barons, depending on what who you ask, a young bureaucrat didn't, live, didn't care enough to have an opinion either way. The economic leaders sit under their seats with death on their faces. They believe that this would be a moment of crackdown. That was a moment where they would be informed that due to increasing economic crisis, the companies would be wrestled, wrestled upon them, arrest from them. In the face of Franco Salazar, they could do nothing but silently comply. The young bureaucrats began to speak with excel and apologetic tone. You are the leaders of this nation's economy. You serve this nation well and put your companies to be the pillars of Iberia. And should you fail now, the nation would fail. And it's for this reason that I remind you all to conduct yourselves with the utmost care. Please, as you continue employing millions of Iberians, do not let them down. Make sure that you hold them up to the sky as firmly as Atlas. The businessman looked around, confused. Were they being let off? Madrid hadn't discovered the corruption. Their book cooking. Confusion gave way to silent elation, and they filed out at twice the speed they filed in. Their loyalty to the economy proves their loyalty to Iberia. Papa's, Papa's boots. Carlos's boots were covered in dirt, and, and not unlike the night of the flood. Today was a good day. The cold January wind kept him cool as he laboriously shoveled dirt out of the trench. He was not making as much as he did at the cannery, but really, he was happy to have a job at all. The weeks after the flood had been hard, but even with his old job, old car, old house gone, life was starting to feel normal again. Just the knowledge of his work might prevent future floods greatly motivated him. It gave him some sense of purpose. Sweet signal. Sunset signaled the end of a productive work day. If only he still had a vehicle of his own, so he did not have to walk a mile back from work. And if only the elevator were not broken, so that he did not have to climb the three flights of stairs to reach his apartment. Papai, papai, shouted his exuberant daughter. Mom got me a new marquita. Carlos exchanged a knowing glance with his wife. On some days, little Maria Francesca seemed to have been more heartbroken by the loss of her doll and the flood than the loss of their home. His work paid off, his family had recovered yet another piece of their old lives. She's been yapping about that thing all evening, he exclaimed his jovial old roommate, embracing Carlos and patting him on the back. You do good work. That was one of the unusual things about life after the flood. With so many homes destroyed, it was now common for individual apartments to be rented to multiple families, but Vitor was a pleasant man, someone who generally enjoyed the company of Carlos and his family. Carlos could once again listen to the same radio shows that he did at his old house with his daughter. Life was never the same after the flood. Never, life could never stay the same, but life did continue. And now life seems to be comfortable once again. Well, all that money hopefully paid off. Uh, look, looking better, but still so much debt. God dang it. Oh, we can still get higher too, huh? Yeah. Purifying flame. The inspector was growing his desperation driven to the bribe some of his more former colleagues to give him. Uh, information on the case which the Valdo de Lid municipal police had uncovered after the dismissal. With Glee, he received news of the anarchists he attracted and failed to properly confirm in Barcelona relocated to Asturias. The night was still young with half a moon slowly making his way across the night sky. The few street light, street light failed to dispel the near darkness of the row where the hideout was located. When no security cameras installed, no one noticed a dark sh uh, shaped dash around the house exterior. A triple knock at the back door interrupted a particularly intense poker game between the two anarchists inside. On creaking over to the door, the larger of the two turned to his friend to complain about the last hand. Turning back, he looked at the shining eyes of a man filled with, uh, filled with mad desperation, holding a wooden bat in one and a gas can in the other. The inspector managed to quickly subdue both men using the element of surprise to tie them to their chairs, now willing to wait for other arrivals. He woke them up ruthlessly with an ice-cold bucket with water and began its interrogation. When both men initially stayed silent, the inspector retorted by merely pouring gasoline over the floor and furniture of the room. Soon the men began to talk. The sooner had been a member of the group working undercover at the noble family, but had ties cut, cut ties with the group back in Barcelona. Before the men, we could tell where the pair had hidden the back door again, open again, this time revealing a group of surprised anarchists who took a moment to take in the scene in front of them. As the men finally dashed forward to, see the, to free the comrades, the inspector drew his light and told them to stop. When they did not, he ran to the door and threw the ladder back inside. He heard violent screams and curses behind him being drowned out by the roaring of excited flames as he ran down the street. Turning for a brief moment, he saw that all men made it out and gave him chase to him. He continued to run even after he lost his pursuers. As his legs carried him until he could run no further, collapsing on the ground, he buried his face in his hands as, fir as he first began to laugh hysterically, or shortly replaced by bitter tears. How far could this go? Mouse of the Tagus. 
Much has changed in Lisbon over the course of the past several weeks. Thousands of people have displaced and all too many dead. The scars once again rolled down, rolled down the streets. Factor some with activity and fishing boats set sail on the horizon. One may be easily led to believe that nothing terrible had happened here. But the people walk along sidewalks, knowing that just a few weeks ago they were covered in debris. They slept in bedrooms. They sleep in bedrooms that they'd never seen before that late in November night. 325. That's how many people the newspaper think have died. But who's to say that number is true? Who became ill in the evacuee shelters and died, and how were they included? And were they included? How many committed suicide, having seen their lives fall apart so suddenly? What could have been done to prevent such a horrible flood? Is Iberia doing enough now to make sure such a thing, sure a thing never happens again? Lisbon comes back to life. Return to its best as Europe's westernmost great city, but it's for a forever change. The flood of 1967, November, will forever be remembered as the worst natural disaster to occur anywhere in the Iberian Peninsula in over two centuries. As a major test in the ability of the young Iberian Union to react to crisis, Lisbon is resilient. And you can thank the government for that. We have no stability. God dang it. How do we have no stability? That makes, that make any, uh, this makes some sense, but we should have more stability than that. So kind of goes bye-bye, huh? A federal economy. Oh, I've been an economic miracle. That's cool. More growth. Factory output. Less growth, I guess. Less construction speed. More production units. Miscellaneous income. Is, okay. Well, that's nice. Um. Well, we did it. I guess we'll have to wait and see what happens As soon next. as I faded in and faded out, Salazar's dead! Today, the housekeeping uh, staff of Sal Benta Palace was horrified to find the corpse of Antonio Salazar in his bath. His body was quickly removed for an autopsy in Bureau, but the knowledge of his death managed to quickly escape the circles of secrecy. Those intended to remain in, until the Iberian government can come up with an official story. Already, numerous underground forces within the Union are mobilizing, warring rumors of sedition within the Portuguese state have come to our attention. With keeping the beloved Caldillo's death as a secret being no longer an option, Iberian authorities must put all the resources in play in order to keep the Union stable. Already, tanks have been spotted moving down the roads in Lisbon, and martial law has been declared in the several regions of Portugal. Uh, Cadillo Franco and Salazar is designated a successor, Marcelo José das uh, Nevas Alves Catano. I've already condemned any force of conspiring to take advantage of Salazar's death, but it does not appear that this will provide a conclusive end of the political chaos in Portugal. Um, it appears that the only thing left to do is crack down as far as possible and divert every possible resource to ensure the Union stays together. We need to secure Portugal now. Oh crap. Ah, there we go. The death of Salazar, Antonio de Oliveira Salazar, Cadillo Babeo, ruler of Portugal, economist and military man, has passed away. A death signifies the ever-changing times Iberia finds itself in. It serves as a reminder of her own mortalities that such a figure such as Salazar must also answer to the call of death. He'll be remembered as a brave man who saved off the common thread and helped guide Iberia down some troubling times. May he never be forgotten. After his passing, we've got to make sure Salazar's death doesn't cause any undue instability. If his passing ends up causing harm here in the living, his memory will surely be sullied. There will be a parade in his honor, then finally we'll ensure that all goes ahead as a smooth transition. A good must be given his due, and that begins with a worthy funeral. Alone Cadillo. Uh, this one is oh, greatly weak in reformism. Rouse the old guard. Empower the loyal. Well, a worthy successor. It's only fair, right, and proper that the highest being in Iberian political society begin the important responsibility of choosing a new successor. And how thankful we are that this being is no other than General Franco himself. The Portuguese people shall be ever so grateful that a man such as Franco was picking the new representative. There may be a few concerns that Spain's own Caudillo Franco is to pick the successor rather than some shamble together committee of various bureaucrats from Portugal, but there shouldn't be any reason to fear. It's a union of equals, and Franco knows this all too well. He has Portugal's best interest at heart, much more so than any pencil pusher. There is assured a worthy successor shall be chosen. Strength and reformism? Go with Mota. We could go with this guy, but I'm pretty sure Kitano, I did Kitano last time, too. Oh, one candidate for the new Caudillo was one Marcelo Catano. A career power of television who has long since held various forms of power in Salazar. He seen by Iberian political societies as a mild reformer. This may raise a few eyebrows among some hardliners. After all, reformers are reformer, but this has been offset by the service to Iberia. Uh, he appears to be truly believe in Iberia and wish for nothing more than its longevity and success. We'll luckily know what to expect of him in their respect, and maybe I'll flank him if need be. He seems to be a safe choice, first and foremost, or at least that's how it appears for the moment. Uh, it will always be important for us to remain vigilant in today's times. The Tito Bustillo okay. Cave. A teenage boy in Asturias has discovered a cave with walls covered in strange paintings of horses. Archaeologists were initially skeptical that the paintings were genuine, but an excavation of the Tito Bustillo cave has revealed that not only are they real, they are soundingly old, in addition to horses. Orca and charcoal paintings of deer and bison have been discovered. One particularly odd painting appears to be depict a sort of sea monster, perhaps a wild depicted by an artist who had only heard of stories of them. Most of the artwork, particularly those near the cave entrance, are dated around 10,000 years ago, but small paintings found deep within its caverns are well over 20,000 years old, potentially the oldest artwork in human history. In addition, the paintings, several harpoons made of bones suggest a society which both fr frequently fish and frequently hunted. Most impressive of all, an artistic or perhaps a ceremonial item was found, a part of the stag's antler carved into a go lifelike goat's head. 
It's not the only first ancient cave discovered in Asturias, but the age and the complexity of the art here hints that the culture of early humans may have been much more sophisticated than previously assumed. Archaeologists are sure to study this cave for years to come. The greatest cave discovery since Almaria. The procession. The gun carriage lumped down the Avenida de los Cadillos, with this procession stretching the full length of the thoroughfare. Representatives of the Civil Guard, Federal Army, Spanish Portuguese Home Guards, and the Accentia kept the slow pace of the marching. And even in Spain's Ireland, the sorrow for Portugal's finest son was genuine. None of the groups of the terrorists of dared to make his move here, lest they evoke the remaining Cadillos' wrath. Me, General. We are here to exit Madrid's limits. We can return to El Prado now. Franco stared down at his personal order earlier to indicate any further insistence on the matter that would get him reassigned to the Western Sahara. Fearing that TV cameras had caught the change in his facial expression, the horse-bound Cadillo turned his face to the sky. As a funeral march across the Iberian internal border, the expressions of grief became much more intense. Entire towns went out to see the coffins of the men who had determined Portugal's destiny for 42 years. Carmen had told Franco that riding on horseback for the 500 kilometers would be an inadvisable for a man of 75, but he did not care. Once reached Lake Cadillo's hometown of Vimeiro, Franco remembered reading about his appointment as finance minister at the last page of a newspaper in 1926. Receiving his congratulations, uh, 10 years later, fighting, uh, with him over Spanish intervention during the war, negotiations with the Union, his mediation during the establishment of the Triumvirate. Franco's heart sunk in a way it had not since his youth. Now, however, it was not, the it was not time for that. After his orderly was replaced by Portuguese counterpart when they had crossed the border, Franco was the only member of the Madrid procession left by the time he stepped off his horse to follow the coffin in the cha chapel. He checked his pocket for the eulogy. Adeus a um cadillo. Uh, Franco's father never loved him, yet during that thing, the yet another thing that set him, the two men apart. Even now, his desire to be buried alongside his parents unsettled the generalissimo. He tried to press his father's slide after he had become Cadillo, ignoring him for the lost cause that was his brother Raymond. He just about managed to do it by the time it was his turn to speak. Antonio, principles of national sovereignty, great united struggle against the red subversion, decent hard-working man with a sense of humor. Franco could not help stop himself from thinking about the man. He had been his rival, a massive pain whenever he got any of his holier-than-thou ideas, and that was for certain. He could feel his skin being burned by the intensity of the camera setups so of the cathedrals moved on to finish his speech. Most of it all, Cadillo sniffed over so quietly, as his sentiments overwhelmed the carefully pranced Practiced emulation that he adopted, and this was real squeaky Galician voice to control. He was my friend. No one outside of beer paid much attention to what he said. Talking in the foreign media was all about speculating what sort of ailment he was suffering from for him to be wearing his characteristic sunglasses indoors. Behind the opaque spectacles, Franco did indeed cry. Poor Franco. Oh wow, 8% growth though. That's double our interest, which is good, even though we're adding over 6 billion to it all the time. Jesus Christ. Oh man. If we could just not spend any money on social stuff, we'd be okay. We would literally be okay. Probably. 68, eh? Better guns. A worthy successor. To be torn on such a decision would have suited the aging Spanish Cadillo perfectly before his arrival for Iberian dominance uh, had died. Now, standing uncertainly alone atop a house of crumbling cards, who wished for the former technocrat was beside him. He always had a clever comment ready for a situation like this. Franco could almost hear the faint whispers of his voice. Yet he was alone, sitting in a large conference room surrounded by empty faced bureaucrats and lackeys who could not rely on a critique. Or sound advice? What do they know of the severe strain put upon the Union by this precarious situation? What do they know about these, or the Portuguese people's mournful cries and the significance of these held for the future of the nation? It was on, uh, it was on him to now hold Iberia together in the face of an ugly and unrelenting world. Hopefully, alongside him, someone to bring the joys and rigors of ruling back to the old man's heart. Brief me again on the two candidates. The almost hushed murmur made many, even those who sat close to the unusually imposing military man, lean in to listen intently. A short pause followed as the room was unsure who should speak first. Seeing the dejection and quiet withdrawal of the man at the head of the table, the discussion was probably started nonetheless. A decision has to be made. And we're back up to 17% stability. Which is still not very good. Go out with the old. Oh, white and black. As time progressed, it became clear that Franco would never find out if his improved results were a sign of the trend. Cadillo Salazar's untimely and unfortunate end had prevented the Cadillos from having another match. The Spaniard had won his, arguably won his first victory by fluke, and now he would never have the chance at a hard won triumph. Even though there were plenty of other things to remember. Salazar, by the chessboard they managed or they played on, held a special, a special appeal. It was a hobby, living it as it was. It was far better to remember the old man for their games of chess rather than by their many arguments over Iberian policy. Franco took some time to make one last examination of the chessboard. It was a plain and an interesting design. White and black pieces on a white and black board. He had it set up at the Portuguese could use preferable table one time, one final time. <clears throat> he decided to never use a board again, so the memories of the provider would remain untainted. The pieces stand there in his memory. Out with the old. So that's it. Goodbye and good luck. Soon to be yet former yes men of Salazar will say to Franco as he announces their timely replacement. I don't recall saying good luck, Franco will reply with a ruthless callousness. Uh, Salazar's time is over, and thus so was the time of his luckies. Great changes are being, uh, beginning to occur in Iberia, and those new times we find ourselves in do not need useless careers such as these funkies. Franco has a grasp on a great political broom with which he is just sleep weaving up any incompetence from the old stooges of Salazar. 
The next phase of the political process alone. Does not need these men, nor does it particularly want them. We're sure they'll get by just fine after all. We replace them with men of a finer political standing. Oh, crap, that's not going to be good. Pragmatist. A quiet day marked a welcome change to the feverish events that have plagued the last few days since Salazar's death. Sat alone in a spacious office, Cadillo Franco, um, silently. Uh, contemplated his choice of successor of Salazar. It had not been easy. The pragma pragmatic Portuguese had always been a uh, hushed voice of reason that he could rely on, even if he despised it. He would miss it. His senior staff had been excited at the opportunity now for the centralized regime, and ensured maximum control of a population that he might need re for, ready for war or worse. Yet Franco knew that he needed more than a figure how to keep Portugal loyal than the Union. His final choice had been the scholarly Marcelo Caetano, a protege of Salazar, who already lived a long life inside the world of politics. His moderate former stance may be an issue that could offset the stability brought on from securing Portugal. As Harlan's may seem as a step too far in the wrong direction, it would be a difficult matter even for his eventual successor to get in with. He sighed, though. It was not for a world that readily embraced the language of hope anymore. Hopefully a wise choice, and the grand inauguration. A momentous day such as this requires a lot of preparation, and it is the first time in the Iberian Union's history that we have a transitional period from Caudillo to Caudillo. The people will need to be aware of the importance of this occasion, so a rather grand ceremony is bound to take place. The public can expect to see all the regular displays of the Iberian prowess, unveiled for the entire nation to be aware of witness, too, and hold dearly in their minds. It shan't be a day that is forgotten about for quite some time, an illustrious affair is deeply needed, even if it's just to hammer home the greatness of this landmark decision. It is sure to be quite the spectacle. We should hopefully settle this new Caudillo right in this place, side by side with El Franco. God bless Franco. Ah. 114. Uh, it's, it's still going up, but not as much as it used to. 6.157. Not great. Uh, inflation has really hit rock bottom for now, which is not bad. 3.2% for base inflation rate. Huh. 7.7% 7 growth is not bad, though. The Grand Inauguration. So we remove this right now. Um, policy is uh, reducing inflation by 0.8%. 0.8%. more percent, but increasing. We go down here to growth. Counterpennies. Counterpennies. No. One percent is better than 0.08%. Maybe they're doing this one's wrong to do. 0.8% is not bad, but growth is better. Back to fresh off pennies. We're going to hit ourselves just a little bit from now, and inflation will get slightly worse. But hopefully, the growth will outpace the inflation. That's it. I'd say that's my hope. Nice. 20 percent stability. Nice. Final preparations. Events so momentous and grandiose can only be compared to the pompous crowning of the ab past absolute autocrats. Yet, this is not some medieval ceremony of authority, but a modern legitimization of a regime so wet behind the ears has not even raised a single generation successfully. No one knew the importance of the appearance of longevity and peace as much as the Spanish Cadillo, who had taken the surprising liberty of inspecting the construction of Lisbon himself. He counted the diverse forms of symbolism he had ordered to be quietly included on the various stages and locations where the rule of the regime he had helped build could finally be stabilized. Pillars of society like the church cannot be forgotten in a historic event such as this. Observing the hur hurried tussle of the many workers conscripted from all over the Union, he allowed himself a small smile of relief. Soon he would, he soon would be the end of the road, his road. Now I just wish that his rival could, out, could have stood beside him in this glorious moment, the Union consolidating. Oh no, now what do we do for the focus tree? I always ask that. A belt of shabund. Uh, Militar Bazek Rosalind. I love Speer. Speer's a funny guy. I still need to get a Speer hoodie. That would, like, no joke, be my first. If I were to do merch, my first line of merch. How oh, is this still here and stable? Oh, RFK still here. Margaret Thatcher, the chosen successor. The former approached a lavish podium, flanked by a seething mass of cheers and jubilation. His eyes, however, remained steady and pointed forwards, examining the deceptive serenity in his face of the man he would soon run a union of nations with. Hands reached out to grasp hold of him as others were swatted away by the countless security personnel which guarded the extended hallway or walkway. Admiring the efforts of the Spanish Cadillo in pre quickly preparing such a substantious court courtiership of the Portuguese capital, he climbed the hastily erected marble stairs that stamped between the aging former general, not exchanging a single word with Caetano, Franco stepped forward to the microphone. His speech, a strange mix of honorable remembrance for Salazar and a desperate call for unity, managed to arouse some excitement amongst his masses of Lisbon's gathered. Catano noted the slightest hint of a satisfied smile on the old man's face upon his retreat to the back of the stage. Now it was his own turn to step forward. He braced physically against the intense din as he quickly shuffled the notes for the speech. Words of reform, moderation, and an ease of tensions on the half of the peninsula were almost lost in the raucous applause that followed. Did he detect a hint of jealousy in Franco's eyes when they left the stage together? No matter. 
He did his part and had, did it well. Forward into a new era for Iberia. Wow, 32% stability. That's insane. I knew Cadillo speaks. When Franco nominated the moderate reformist Ca Marcelo Catano on Salazar's successor, or as his successor, the celebrations roared across Iberia. Catano's first address to the Iberian Council was widely syndicated on TV and radio, as estimated to have been as seen or heard by as many as one in four Iberian adults. Antonio de Oliveira Salazar, the 100th Prime Minister of Portugal and a founding Caldillo of the Iberian Union, was a lion of a man, and at the beginning of Salazar's tenure, fewer than one in three Portuguese children who could read, most elderly lived in destitution. One in seven infants would not live to see their first birthday, but under his wives and benevolent guidance. On the eve of the Iberian Union's founding, three or four children could read. All elderly citizens were provided pensions, and infant mortality had been cut in half. As what initiatives as Cadillo of Iberia saw great reduction of poverty, having ensured that every single child is taught to read, and cut infant mortality in half once more. No man goes hungry in the streets. No child is denied the right to an education. Iberians lived ten years longer than average than they did a single generation ago. Did our nations left watching the ships as we mourn the passing of one of the greatest leaders in living memory? Cordillo Franco has given me an enormous honor in nominating me to succeed in such an intelligent, patriotic, and compassionate Cordillo. I pledge to follow in the Salazar's footsteps to promote the welfare, security, and development of all of Iberia. I stand together with all men and women of Iberia, uh, uh, strong in my devotion to the nation and to Almighty God. I'll continue just as Salazar did to honor the victims of Barcelona and all those martyred in defense of the Union. I will lead by these principles to advance the progress of the Union with civility and dignity to advance the public interest with courage and to strive for more compassionate, stronger, happier, and healthier Iberia. Always at the side of Cadillo Salazar was Cadillo Francisco Franco. I pledge to work together with so the Honorable Franco as an equal leader and a close friend as we strive to build this righteous Union. Together we shall bring Iberia into the br our brightest hour, ever vigilant against those who would seek her destruction and ever focused on her stability and her well-being. Together we shall continue Iberia's march forward, never tiring, never yielding, always working, always fighting. Catano's first days. Catano soon begins first day's Portugal's new Cadillo. It'll more likely be mostly a formal affair, greeting his new staff and winning hearts and minds, but it'll be something Catano will need to get used to. We should excel in the role and get a good feel for what needs to be done in his new office. It's first day, so it's likely won't be seeing any dramatic moves, but an eye is still best kept on the new Cadillo. Vigilance is key in these difficult times, and we can't rest easy for no one these days. It's for the best, though, that Catano feels warm and welcome in his job. We'll make sure it becomes a fine Cadillo for Iberia. Making new appointments? Salazar's former yes man will likely be in for surprise when the hero of Catano spends a rejuvenate his office with his own men. Catano clearly has no need nor use for his bureaucratic vestiges of a dead man, and said he looks to the future. A future more precisely with his own people, he will know that Catano's not just some carbon copy replacement of Salazar. He's his own man with his own ambitions. These ambitions will hopefully be delivered with his influx of new staff. Iberian political life will no doubt be impacted by these latest changes to the era of Salazar slowly fading from memory. Which is not a bad thing. Following the grand inauguration, Catano quickly developed into administrative work, attempting to gain even a clear picture of the situation the Bureau was finding itself in. Knowing the problem facing regional representations, he recognized uh, his own important role not just as a competent replacement for Salazar, but also in being a figure of Portuguese interest in the Union. He was able to negotiate himself effectively with the members of the Gabirian Council. Catano figured that despite their seemingly lack of power in opposing Cadillo's decision making, that they were still extremely important in the process of a smooth governance. If an issue were to divide the two dictators, it may also help gain the support to overwhelm Franco's arguments. The first day was over, and a flurry of meetings and paperwork established the authority behind the closed doors of government in the same way as inauguration had cemented his standing on the international stage through foreign press coverage. A small rest in his new office finally allowed him to clear his mind slightly. He looked out of the grand windows on a bustling Madrid, so heaving with activity despite the late hour. Pleased that now he could begin to shape the direction that the Union would take in the future, he uh, out happily important. Uh, important work had to be done, and he was prepared for it. A bright future ahead? A tour of Iberia. A good deal should know his people. A new one especially will need to grasp people's needs and demands as he rules over them with great oversight. In order to satisfy this particular need of his new office, Catano should go on the grand tour of Iberia to meet with the masters face to face. Some in Iberian political stability. After the nose up at the idea, seeing as uh, stinking of Catano's alleged reformist mindset, but many more see it as a welcoming take on the rule of Cadillo. It will certainly cause a bit of stern and shall show off the Cadillo role for the public to gawk at face to face. Hope some form of rejuvenation through this being in the public life shall come from all this preparation. For the good of the Union. All gets uh, rest easy in the safe and sound knowledge that Catano was almost certainly the right pick for the role of Cadillo. He has thus far aggressive uh, office with his, with his professionalism and is reinvigorated with a welcoming freshness, kicking out Salazar's cronies and the various other stooges and lackeys that made up with the crux of the office, and going on a grand tour of Iberia has certainly put Catano in good, our good books. The union looks to be strong, sturdy, and stable with Franco and Catano ruling over the nation as dual Cadillos. That's a welcoming side to see the maintaining of the union's stability, with the choice of Cadillo now seemingly entrenched. For the greater good of Iberia, Catano will hopefully prove himself to be more than capable of Cadillo, touring Iberia. Population centers all over the half peninsula were surprised by the announced, unannounced visits of the new Portuguese Cadillo, Catano, as he was making his way around his realm. Only briefly notifying the Spanish counterpart Catano was shortly after establishing the bureaucratic framework for his administration, he set out to tour Iberia. It was necessary to gain a more complete picture of average life and assess the extent of the divisions were politically unstable for the nation. 
One of the stops he made was in the border city of Badajoz, situated on the left bank of the Guardiana River, uh, and extremely close to the unofficial Portuguese uh, border. Catano's motorcade drove to the city, making a stop at the bull ring. A site where, according to the regime dissidents, the Spanish nationals had murdered hundreds of Republicans. Choosing to only take a small security detail, Catano made his way around the street on foot. He was recognized very quickly and crossed began to forum, following his walk and cheering him. Once he was at the town hall, he requested for a desk to be brought out, which he sat behind. Motioning for the onlookers to come forward as he instructed a security detail to pick out a number of individuals to line up in front of his new desk. He then began to question them in a friendly manner, taking the time to get to know each one of them's picked. Listening to the concerns, he made a few notes and asked for the personal opinions of the regime. As no one would openly answer, he wrote, again, wrote, a few, wrote down a few notes and made his way back to the building, or bullring. Uh, newspapers around the country began to follow his journey, documenting each visit and guessing where he'd turn up next. During the event, Catano's grand tour and quickly went down into Iberian consciousness. A commendable effort. Not bad. As we'll see, what's the next focus tree after this? Oh, 6.2%. Oh, inflation, like I did say, is going up. But growth has gone up by 0.4, so we're like half, like half of that inflation, the reduction. Well, it's already here, basically, already, which is really nice. Um... 40% effectiveness, so once you get 1% will be really good. We'll really be cooking again, so that'll be good. I think we did that last time I played Iberia, too. But we're doing a healthy amount of political power, which is actually very, very nice. But happy October, everybody, as the French people are killing themselves. And I'm, I'm a little surprised. I, I know this continent isn't like... Especially the early content for Iberia is pretty much the same. But with the French Civil War... I mean, we, we, we have nothing about the French killing themselves, but whatever. For the good of the Union. It almost felt like continuity. That was beauty of the effective reform. In the critical eye of the public, Cadu Cateno had already taken great efforts to ease his transition to power without hitches. As numerous visits and attempts to understand the mood and problems of localities around the Union had given him impetus to carry forth his ideas and display them proudly to the various councils and to his Spanish counterpart. It was not his will that he was representing, but that of the Iberian people. Not only had he effectively positioned himself in his new role so the general populace would support him, but also had managed his staff and administration well, as given the support of many in the civil service. He now stood at the pinnacle, admired by many without the ruinous taint of scandal. Catano was positioned to be a unifying and stabilizing figure in Iberian politics. His reluctance to immerse himself in the cheap power of politics in the Salazar and Franco had but engaging in was refreshing to do those in the higher office. Seeing a change from trying to gain relative gains over one another to working for the absolute gain of the Union made Catano one of the first two Iberians. Not a Portuguese nationalist, but a product of his ongoing integration between the two historic nations. Under his rule, the future began to look a little brighter. A different kind of hand at home. Nothing yet. Well, I guess we gotta wait for some more crises to happen first. Because there's always a crisis here, but right now we are extremely stable. It's very nice. It's very good. Well, I know we have resources available, but we don't need the resources right now, you know? Oh, peace conference is over. Calculating the effects. And what are the effects? Did someone here die? Or did someone down in Africa die? Ooh, oh, oh. Now that's a beautiful bright blue. Or moderately bright, bright blue under Mr. Hatman. So those guys versus these two. All Russian government of the Far East. Oh, boy. I would like... Oh. Rozhevsky to win and it could beat Yeltsin. That'd be interesting. What is this? Tajikistan Legion, huh? Mr. Glasses. Tajikistan. So, the fate of the Iberian Council. Good almost seven years ago, as the legislative body helped the Kadyrs rule the nation's liberalized regime a bit. Uh, the Iberian Council served through all the important events in recent history the Battle of Barcelona, the economic restructuring of the country, and the death of Salazar. As powers were left vague to avoid protests from the various groups that formed the government, but it seems clear that the role of the council may be clarified. Must be clarified, and, and such an extraordinary meeting has been called. All the council members, the ministers, and cadres will attend it, and the meeting will keep going until a final decision on what exactly the role of the council's reach. Let the meeting begin. The State of the Union. The fall of the Triumvirate has put things into perspective. It may be that this union, no one's necessary act to stop the marching Huns, needs this large scale refor reformation to save itself from being thrown into the dustbin of history. We are all to call out far and wide across the nation, across the spectrum, to decide what the future will hold for Iberia, whether we are increasing. To increasingly reform ourselves or just keep the status quo remains to be seen. What is needed, however, is a discussion to decide how the best procedure to avoid certain doom. Call forth the grievances. Oh god, we love public meetings. That's never a good idea. The call went out far and wide. Some didn't even believe it was going to be genuine at first. And it was such. A towering leadership of the Iberian Union must send out a message across the political spectrum, seeking dialogue on how to best address the issues facing the nation. And maybe that some of them have something useful let's to say, and can bring something new to the table that will see to our survival rather than our destruction. Oh, there's maybe a lost cause, whom we will pay no real notice to. Whatever decision may be, we shall hear them out and decide what's best for the future of Iberia. Conservatives. Uh, the old guard from the regimes of Salazar and Franco have quite loudly raised the concerns of potential democratic turn uh, Iberia may be taking. Falanges, hardline militaries, and chief ideologues from the old days are becoming increasingly concerned about the Iberia's new direction, as seeing as a treacherous and antagonistic to the ideas that they worked so hard to implement. It's time to hear them out in order to avoid a major and dramatic rift in our union so they could have, that could have deadly consequences. Standard keyboard. 
uh, and this is where we'll be working, said Yao as he set a finger down to the dusty typewriter on the tiny desk of the tiny office. We collect weekly reports on Friday morning, so he expected to have it done by Thursday morning. Or a Thursday afternoon. The new guy, Carlos, nodded and shuffled around to get his things out of his briefcase. It was his first day working in Porto, at the regional office of the Federal Ministry of Agriculture. In Xiao's opinion, he seemed decent enough, even for a Spaniard transfer from Madrid. Now he was Galician and spoke acceptable Portuguese, waiting in his favor. Xiao was about to leave when another glance when another glance at the typewriter reminded him of something critical. Carlos, do you know how to type Escar or Cesar? Es Cesar? Es what? Uh, asked Galician asked the Galician bewildered. His new boss sat the keyboard on the writers. In Spain you use QWERTY. Here he is H Cesar. So you gotta learn to type, start over, and no, I'm not getting you a Spanish typewriter unless you want to take it up with the acquisitions. Now look, I'll teach you the important things. You notice that there's no key for number one, you use lowercase l for that. There's also no zero, so you use uppercase O for asterisks. You type lowercase x and backspace, then a plus sign over it, and for the number sign you just Xiao's hands flew over the typewriter, manually setting the carriage to type two slashes over an equal sign, achieving a uh, uh, pound sign. Or number sign, Carlos, not as slowly. In 37, Salazar are personally demanded H. Caesar as a Portuguese type before man, and in life scorn any attempt at establishing an Iberian standard unless it meant H. Caesar for all. After Salazar's passing with an abandoned federal bureaucracy, the government is beginning to discuss the problem. There may be some room for improvement, of course. Separatists. The history of Iberia has been a history filled with interests and uh, notions of separatism. Past Catalans, Galicians, and others have demanded autonomy and nationhood for years and years. These requests are usually stamped out through the tried and tested means of reactionary force, but now it's us time to seek dialogue. A lot of blood has been spilled in the name of regional question, and many are wondering if about the future of Iberia, if it may be time to talk to separatist organizations. It's never time to talk to organizations. Especially those types of organizations. A new beginning. If the final, final puzzle piece was beginning to fall in place. A dissatisfied heiress of a minor noble family with no formal way of escaping her trapped existence. A former anarchist who had replaced the trappings of ideology with those of love and finally a group of relocating freedom fighters. Initially, the ultimate question remained even with the acquisition of the anarchist testimonies. It confirmed that the servant worked undercover for the anarchist cell while he worked for the noble family. But where were they? Had the pair moved to the cell with two austerias? Had they been hidden somewhere else entirely? If they met with the anarchists in Barcelona, why would they have continued moving further once the servant had left the organization as the anarchists relayed during his interrogation? I had to put a great distance between the former reality the two wanted to escape. The inspector began to look through his files again, this time taking great pains to pursue the money which he had been withdrawn multiple times from the girl's account. He took note of a particularly large and out of place sum and moved his attention towards gaining a better insight into the property market of Barcelona. After months of anonymous calls and information pursual, he finally triangulated a small apartment which seemed to match both the time frame and withdrawal of the amount. He found him. A chance of redemption? The original debate. <clears throat> Perhaps the most contentious issue in the process of the issue of the separatism? Basque, Galicians, Catalans, etc. All of them made the claims for nation's hood and it had sometimes used violence as a means to achieve the goals. The history of the issue is seemingly everlasting has become ingrained beneath the very skin of Iberia. Many have died fighting for and against the ideas of the separatists, but a radical opinion or option of paying heed to the separatists is now available. So too is an option to shut them out once again. On the one hand, listening to the separatists and giving them a real special regional program will perhaps allow them for a future of Iberia to remain stable without and whole in the end. Terrorism would hopefully eventually cease and the needs of the people will be replicated within a deal we could hopefully reach with them. On the other hand, giving any sort of leniency to their demands may say the dominoes often force See to the balkanization of Iberia. Whatever decision we make, we are bound to upset someone. We must do whatever is best for the future of Iberia so a disaster does not strike in these world changing times. Will be heard? Spain is one. Technocrats. Unusual allies emerged during our current undertaking of talks and reforms. The Franco appointed technocrats have pointed out that they're interested in the reformation process and wish to help us through guidance and advice. Certain figures that wish to partake in our large undertaking of the process are from the Opus Dei, an institution of the Catholic Church with an interest in liberal economics. No doubt all guard adherents of Tartar could be suspicious of their involvement in the process. Whether these technocratic individuals can be trusted or not remains to be seen. The placating of the Separatists. It once seems like a pipe dream, of course, <clears throat> that the Cadillos were even considered notions of regionalism in the nation of Iberia or even in the previous nations of Spain and Portugal. And time and time again, the despots, monarchists, and governors of Iberia's past had ruthlessly crushed the Separatist ideas or dreams. In response, the Separatists had turned to politics by way of the gun and a seemingly everlasting cycle of violence began to grip Iberia now, however. The cycle might just be starting to crumble. With the promise of listening to the regionalists and considering their demands for a real spe special regions program, the separatist movements now have begun forced to take pro the process seriously. A real breakthrough may arise from this, as it's been enough to make any hardline separatist a zealot think twice about the would-be terrorist attack. While the issue has certainly not put, been put to bed, a clear expression of confidence in the process has been given by the regionalists. By proxy, this means some confidence has also been given to the governance. Now, this decision may come at a cost. There are many in Iberia who would rather die than see the nation break up into pieces. Indeed, many, many, some may believe that this olive branch to separatism will hasten this, of course. It's nothing but the delusions of staunch paranoia, but we must be wary. Not only will not only the separatists, but of those within their own governance as well. A wary start, but nothing uh, start nonetheless. Found debate, huh? No need for haste. Oh boy, she goes in carefully. Whoa. Oh, Gar hangs on. Oh God. Uh, conservatives raise concerns. 
Oh, weak of stability. Oh, God. Balance council. Choose carefully. Weaken sovereignty. Slow burn liberalization. Let them in. Call for, for the Congress. Handle Kitano. Dismiss the remnant. Prepare administrators. Limited sacrifices. Rotate the general. Speak to the governors. Tighten the window. A truly new state, huh? Wow. Conservatives raise concerns, of course. Those who are more defined as conservative or political establishment have rather loudly raised concerns towards the speed of the reforms that have grasped by beer in political society. What they could do is personally hit head honchos from the old guards stated clearly and concisely the anxiety towards what is currently taking place in the nation. Believing that the pregnant reform reformation will allow for the scourge of liberalism and even worse communism to once again flow into Liberia, the old guard of conservatives have written a rather impassioned plea that states that the changes occurring on all fronts threaten not only our political existence of our regime but also the very future of Liberia. We write as a collective to give you our genuine advice that this process may very well destroy everything we've worked so hard to build. This process could lead to a catastrophic turn of events that would tear Liberia apart from the inside. Please do not let this happen. A stirring letter, stirring letter it may have been, but we still hold on to the real power in Liberia, and we choose to dismiss the concerns of the vestiges if need be. We can try to pay heed to their opinions and give them a promise to listen to further to their advice. The people. A key question has emerged while we've gone on with these reforms. Are we to open this process up to the people? Or are we to carry this endeavor out beyond closed doors? Liberal elements have recommended that the debates be broadcast to the public in order to truly open the process to the masses. The decision to take in public input would be drastic and will no doubt or showcase a commitment for democratic reform. On the other hand, do we want the public to potentially be meddling in the matters they know little about? Or if we were to allow them a voice, we could give them a clear platform to voice their opinions. Or could we just simply pay them lip service and pay them no, no heed to their ideas? I like that idea the most. Technocrats appeal to Congress. With the ongoing process chugging along, of course, the technocrats aligned with the Opus Dot organization have sent out a plea wishing for the furthering of the involvement of the process. Believing that the process apparently needs a qualifying voice to speak up on certain matters, they've sent a number of proposals that they seek to bring to the table. One such proposal they are particularly pushing is the improvement of civil liberties for the Iberians. On the outset, these proposals all seem all well and good, but God knows what these people are truly after. One thing this process cannot allow for is the fifth column to rise once again. It occurred once before and it took the strength of an entire nation and a sea of blood to stop the fifth column antagonist. That being said, it could be worth placating these people if we were just embark on a real reform in Iberia. These syncrats could certainly prove to be a key part of the process if we were to take them in the proposals aboard. A letter of approval. The figures that make up the old guard seemingly rejoice at their response that we will listen to them closely. At their concerns, we will place them on the board. Once again, writing to ourselves, they wrote a, a pleasant and congratulatory letter that praises our decisions. In a jubilant letter, uh, co signed by the major old guard figures. The conservatives have stated, to our humble we've given, we have given, we give our most grateful thanks that you have decided to pay attention to your oldest, most thankful supporters. It is extremely pleasing that you hear that you take our concerns about the future of Iberia seriously, and I'll see to it that the fifth column and the agents of chaos will be being, bringing ruin to this, to this nation throughout this process. We cannot us to be able to help any way we can give it to, uh, in any way we can see to it that a great calamity does not occur. We shall gratefully give you our support, and you can rest easy that no further complaints will arise should the current situation be kept. Evidently, it seems that the conservative support of the government has increased. We need to count on these men should show their eyes uh, further down the line. We have listened to our oldest and wisest supporters. If anyone knows it's best, it's them. Well, we'll see. I'm probably going to regret doing that in the future, but oh well. 7.7% was not bad. Hey, now we're back where we were at uh, earlier with higher uh, growth, even though inflation is higher, which does suck. Whatever. But hey, we're not dead yet. So, uh, if you enjoyed the video, though, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow as we might end the campaign in the next episode. Maybe, but maybe not. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.